Hi, Jeff. <laughs> All right, where the recording is going. Go ahead, Amber. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, definitely glad to have everyone on board to review this VAD training. So I had looked through it a couple months ago um, in preparation to make some additions or some changes for the education committee. Um, and it seemed like we had some pretty significant input from our um, hospital stakeholders. And we thought that maybe bringing this back for a sort of more comprehensive review is a good idea. Um, so with that, do you have anything else, Shelly, for your housekeeping stuff? Yeah, I don't know if everyone's familiar with the Google Meet product. Um, if you're not, if you have your mouse over the bottom of your screen, the buttons magically appear for the audio, the video, and leaving the meeting. Um, attendees are advised the meeting is being recorded. So anything said verbally, anything viewed via webcam or typed in the chat will become part of the recording. Um, and then we'll monitor the chat and the hand raising for questions. If you're attending by phone only, you may need to press star six to unmute yourself. And thank you for your participation, patience. And Ed Betterton just emailed, he'll be on shortly. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I thought maybe it'd be a good idea to kind of go around and introduce everybody um, to make sure that we can kind of know who's on the call today and um, we're able to communicate a little bit better. I'm Amber Rice, um, I chair the education work or committee. Um, so I'll be helping out with the work group um, and I'm down here in Tucson. I'll go next. Um, I'm Jeff Dauberpool and I work at Mayo Clinic Hospital. I'm an RN and perfusionist. Um, however, not clinical anymore. I just do VAD education and um, <clears throat> uh, as well as ECMO and short term uh, support for the ICU. And community training has always been part of my role. Um, so I've done a fair amount over the years um, with fire departments and um, um, other community settings, as well okay. as the, the in house staff training. Well, thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm Gail Bradley. I'm the medical director for the Bureau of EMS and Trauma System. Uh, many of you worked with us when we created this first curriculum a few years ago. Uh, we tried to update these every few years, and it sounds like there was great uh, input that you gave by email to Shelley. Uh, so we thought we'd try to get the group together and really update it now that we've had some opportunities to utilize this for training. So thank you, everyone. I'm Sandy Nygaard. I'm the pre-hospital coordinator for Banna Goldfield and Banna Ironwood. And uh, I'm also on the education committee. Thank you, Sandy. I am Lucy. I'm one of the RN MCS coordinators at Banner University in Phoenix. I also tend to do most of the facility education here at Banner Phoenix, as well as do some of the out-of-hospital training for EMS, fire departments, and such on LVADs and artificial hearts. And I'm Patty Killingsworth. I'm also from Banner University Medical Center here in Phoenix and the intake coordinator. When we were a smaller program, I did most of the EMS training before we had Lucy, but now we have Lucy, so she does quite a bit of that. Awesome. So I know I, I definitely have a couple things on my list to tackle. I don't know if, um, Shelly, I'm happy to pull up the PowerPoint. It looks like you have it, great. Yeah, how did you want to work this? Do you want me to make edits on the fly here? Yeah, or did you we can make edits on the slides or take notes. It might be easier just to edit them on the slide, shall we? Probably. Okay. Anything for slide one? <laughs> the date. <laughs> well, we do um, actually include total artificial heart in all of the training that we do at Banner University Medical Center here in Phoenix because we are implanting TAHs. Okay, so put maybe TAH in the title as well. Just TAH. Oh. Artificial. Artificial part. Okay, um, so if we kind of move on, maybe 
it would be good to kind of buzz through and see what's in here quickly. I don't know. There's like 40 slides. <laughs> so, yeah. um, do you want to um, get me to add it to the meeting invite and then everybody can access it? Um, no, I think it's probably fine that we're all looking at the same thing. Let's just move through and we'll see how quickly we can move. If anyone has stuff that they think is um, specifically incorrect or um, should we should change the wording of or has been updated, let us know. And just out of interest, because I know, Amber, you had made some changes yeah. uh, initially. Is this that version with changes? No, it's not. No. Uh, are we able to pull up that one just so that, because I think you had already kind of identified some of the things that needed updating. Yeah, let me look. Okay, I'm gonna stop presenting and Amber can present. There was stuff I thought probably could be eliminated from here. Um, I did some training recently for Phoenix Fire Department and noticed that all the none of the content is wrong. It just seemed like a little bit ridiculous too repetitive much. where we could kind of consolidate all the things about a particular topic together and go through it once rather than three or four times. Okay. So I will, let me just, I can share mine then. Um, hopefully my edits will be obvious. I usually put them in red. <laughs> so I need to share this now. <clears throat> share. Okay, tell me if you guys can see that. It is opening up right now. Perfect. Okay, cool. Um, so this slide, I didn't have any specific changes on. Um, assessing and managing VAD patients. Um, I don't know what the VAD hotline is. Is that in here? I think it's this one, right? Is this our VAD hotline? I think this is where I was a little bit confused. So each difference. Oops, sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Each hospital. So we only had like them, but then the next slide is this. And then we have, so I guess maybe I'll just check and make sure these are okay. So we have BUM think, Phoenix. Uh, and just to kind of give a reminder on this piece, what we tried to do, and so we may need updating, was if any number or where each center's kind of phone number was listed, we tried to include a picture of that so that uh, if EMS encountered someone from a certain center, they knew where to find that contact information. So this is our Banner Phoenix contact number. This I just chatted the updated office number for Banner Phoenix, but the hotline, the 819 is correct. The 819 so, correct. That's, so 839-9300. Um, and then we have Banner Tucson. This is just the number. I don't believe that that one's changed. Dignity. And we have Mayo. Yeah, that's still a good good number. Okay, perfect. Um, and this one, let's see. And then we have our, we go into like our bad overview here. <laughs> Can we, um, I, I think we need to be real careful about the, um, the terminology um, like was brought up in the first, in the opening slide, um, you know, there is a distinction between, you know, bad is a very general term. Right. It, does, it doesn't include TAH. So um, as we go through the PowerPoint, um, I think the all-encompassing all term, it, it would be mechanical circulatory support device or MCSD. We may okay. want to use that because it includes both LVADs and the total artificial heart. Um, so it's, it's, I want to make sure that's clear throughout. And cause we like, we just do LVADs and I don't want anyone to get confused, you know, thinking um, a, a bad usually means wow. LVAD, but not necessarily. So okay. to be technically correct, I think, uh, I don't know what the other centers think, um, if we should be that specific or not. That's how we actually refer to ourselves here at the Phoenix campus as MCS coordinator. So we prefer that too, just wasn't, but we understand most people tend to still go bad. 
So like on the back of here though, you can still call this your bad hotline, yes. right? Yeah. Okay. It's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this slide explains that a little bit, but again, this is kind of unnecessary um, information or redundant with the other centers. Yeah. Okay. Same thing. Same thing on slide six. Um, that, you know, all the narrative right there really doesn't need to be said twice. It's kind of summarized on that first slide that you had, or the second slide. So this part, you mean? Yeah. Or all of it. Um, no, I think the if you go back to the second slide i think that pretty much sums it up you can call you know that the message is call the hotline call okay. the number and um all that on th that other information is um redundant uh this one yes we'll get rid of this whole box and leave the picture you can get rid of that whole box okay so Maybe what we should do before we get into the centers is kind of define uh, for EMS up front kind of the new terminology uh, that we want them to think about. So kind of between um, you scroll up just a little bit further. Oh, up more. Yeah, up more. So kind of I think even potentially even between the title and slide one or is really say we're talking about bad patients, total art, artificial heart. And so this is the term that we're utilizing. So even though um, EMS knows that, we probably need to start introducing that terminology to them. I agree, just a couple definitions um, in the opening. And then I would, say, I would say, you know, LVAD rather than VAD, um, and then just explain, just a, a note explaining that VAD is used, usually used interchangeably with LVAD. So it's in the clinical circulatory support or MCS encompasses both the left ventricular assist device. Oh yeah. You probably don't have to add it to that top bullet if you're gonna have. Oh yeah, you're right. A bulleted um, LVAD and then TAH. How's that? I like it. Do you want a second bullet that just briefly says implanted artificial pumps to support the circulation? Right here? As a large circle bullet, I suppose. Oh. I see what you're saying. Ed Betterton just joined. Hey guys, sorry, I'm walking back from the OR to the office. Hi, Ed. Okay, how about that? Good for definitions? And then we kind of, I'm okay with that. And then we kind of go through just like the intro. We want to change anything on here with the terminology? I think pretty much everything that says straight up VAD, unless it's referring to an LVAD, is going to have to switch over to MCS for continuity purposes. I okay. agree.
But that here's okay. Not that one. Or I could say hospitals hotline. Or just hotline. Our center, center's hotline. I'm going to kind of go through here. Would it be easier just to list, list them rather than have a slide for each individual center? Would it be simpler just to have them all on one slide? We can. What Gail was mentioning is that she had a picture in here so that it showed on each, for each type of device how they, where they put their contact information. So if you don't think that's needed or accurate, we certainly could list them. I just think the, I just think the crews kind of know now because they've been um, this has been sort of part of their uh, routine for several years now. So okay. I, I'm pretty, I don't know. I mean, I just think they kind of know this, but it you know it's it's up to whatever the group thinks. I, I would just to shorten the presentation, I would suggest um, just on one slide, just a list of the numbers with the different centers and then maybe um, just one picture, pick pick a picture showing a, a sticker on the controller. Yeah, I, you know, um, but I don't think you need to take up four or five slides to show all the. All the yeah, or like yeah. the picture I, of the back of the heart mate and the picture of the H bad with the different stickers. This one? This picture? Yeah, that picture and then the one that has that's on the Mayo Clinic slide. Oops. This one? Yeah, that yes. covers both both the LVAD devices. Um what about the TAH? It's really loud, so. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can't, can't miss it. <laughs> hope you you so. hope not, right? Hope not. Um, we give them medic alert bracelets. <laughs> okay, so I'll list those out. Well, maybe just a slide showing with the TA that they have a medical alert bracelet. Because that might be a little bit different. I know my guys out here in Pinal County have had a couple of artificial hearts. Not the guys. They've had the patients with the artificial hearts. <laughs> yeah. So um, usually when I do the talk, at least, I tell them about the medical alert bracelet. And then it's also labeled on the backpack that the patient has all their stuff in. Cool. But I don't have a picture of that specifically. Yeah. And I think just remember, you know, some of us and some of our crews, this is going across Arizona. So we always have to remember there's going to be some agencies and some crews that may have gotten a ton of education, but other agencies that they're going to just download this presentation and give it. And so we need to always just remember that we want to have as much information that someone who does not have any background of this could essentially provide this training based on the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. I, I so mean, is there... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. It's it's already like you know to get C, uh, CE hours really a minimum. A lecture can be thirty minutes. So, um, I just think you know quick pictures. Just keep in mind that we this is something that goes up on our state website for anyone to download and then to give a lecture on. So, with with that being said, in the more rural areas, uh, would it help with a? map or any sort of like city listings in terms of where to bring patients on that one slide we were referencing i dealing with the pre-hospital people i think they pretty much um know where to take the patients um because they've already called the number on the uh, on the backpack or the, the uh, patient support. So um, they will okay. tell them where to take that patient. Perfect.
And if we want to talk about those ads. I feel like slides five and six that you have, or yeah, five and six are, could be condensed into one overarching theme of what an LVAD is. Mm -hmm. So, like move the fact that the patients have heart failure to that first slide and then probably everything else can go. Okay. Oh, it's already in there for heart failure. Yeah. So then probably we can probably just end. The patients aren't actually on this particular slide. They don't have that controller anymore. So that's not something that they would see anyways. This one? Or this one? This one. Um, we, we, have, on we, we, we still have someone with an EPC controller out there. You do? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I know he, he's going on close to 11 close to 11 years but he had uh that clamshell repair so we couldn't upgrade him oh okay then i stand correct no I, i'm teased i but i mean but yeah i would get rid of it because he yeah. like he's an n of one i would not i would not set this presentation for him yeah they also will never ever remember half of these pictures we're showing them yeah they will not be studying the devices <laughs> i'm sure yeah, I think um, just in general, uh, sorry, I was going to say just some general pictures about what kind of the devices look like. It's this like kind of a silly story, but there literally was a case uh, in our area where someone had a life vest on and um, it was interpreted to be a bomb <laughs> when it was their life vest. And so just recognizing what people are wearing these devices that may be unfamiliar, just some general pictures are probably useful. <laughs> And the, the picture on the upper right there is that's a retired pump. We still have uh, probably 12 patients on the, the old HeartMate 2, um, but they have a newer pump, a HeartMate 3. I don't know if it'd be worth swapping that picture out for the newer pump. I'm trying to find the picture. That um, slide six you can get rid of altogether, yeah. yeah. I try to move stuff into here. Perfect. So not trying to jump ahead. Last time I gave this presentation, I felt that after slide five with the LVAD overview, that that might have been a more opportune time to give a little bit of device specific, equipment specific information, like how it actually works and all the stuff that they see. Cause that's at that point, people are confused about what we're talking about. So and the then, LVAD overview before the, the phone numbers? No, no, no. I think later in the presentation where we haven't gotten yet, there's more information on the different LVADs. Okay. If you go way down. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that moving that, like making that information a little bit more succinct and moving it up right past the overview. Okay. Because, yeah. Can do that. Yeah, that's the way I would teach it too. Okay. So in this one, we have our. Well, I don't like that slide. And they actually got rid of, they're getting rid of the designation. So I feel like we could, yeah. you guys good with nixing that slide? Yes, yes, yes. Hold yeah, on. I mean, I put it up in here that it can be permanent, temporary treatment or a permanent solution. Is that enough to say? Yes. Yeah. Insurance has gotten rid of those designations technically, so. Okay. So I think we do need to add some talking points though. Um, just thinking, like I kind of look at these just knowing that you've got an agency in a rural county that goes and downloads this, they are gonna need to know what temporary or permanent means. So I think that understanding that that some different methods that these are used. So why someone may have it for a short period of time or for someone else, it may be a permanent device. And maybe so I think this for tempor temporary versus permanent. What about, um etiology or reason people get their LVAD. Yeah, I think something to kind of explain like why there might be different reasons and what it's used for. Okay. Because you guys are the experts when you give this, so you have all that knowledge base to kind of like 
make this better. Um, and some of it could almost just be in the teaching notes. We do utilize that a lot when we put these presentations together is that we'll put speakers notes in there. So that if someone's trying to provide the training, they can just kind of utilize those speakers notes. So what would we put in here? What do you guys think would be the important indications then? Well, can you go back to um, the previous slide? Let's see. I think we could probably find a way to add it indications into here. It was a very long slide. I wonder if I should take this out and put it here. Indication slide, and then you can say. And then what would you guys list here? Um, it's so like, do we want the medical yeah. definitions, like ischemic cardiomyopathy, drug-induced cardiomyopathy, peripartium? induced cardiomyopathy or do we want to be way more basic than that? Probably more basic, but because huh. heart failure is kind of the, ba I mean, that is the basic piece is heart failure, whether they're waiting for an organ transplant or if it's going to be for the rest of their life, but it is heart failure. That's the, that's the way to say it though. Yeah. I think heart failure while waiting on transplant or until end of life, I think is good. Yeah, and I don't know why this is tiny, but what we said. Yeah, that's kind of what I was looking for. Like the sort of simple explanation. Of... So are we gonna try to um, filter in TAH information in this kind of intro section of the PowerPoint? Or Lucy, would you normally just split off the LVAD and then talk about the TAH independently. I kind of talk about the TAH at the end because throughout this first part, I tend to emphasize about the left ventricular and how it's only unilateral support. And then we get into biventricular failure and the need for the TAH. So I just emphasize the left sided heart failure. Okay. I did add some stuff in there later, but well, here's our special considerations. This is the question that I had here, because this is, um, I just wanna make sure that we're consistent. So right here in this slide, we say usually not indicated. Um, external equipment control of power sources. Can we change that last bullet to has both internal and external components? <clears throat> if that helps. Because they have the implanted pump and then all the outside stuff. The L -bags. Because this wouldn't be a bad place to first introduce the fact that the drive line comes out of the abdomen and don't cut it. Let me see this. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that slide. one. 
that's good information. It's just an old old picture that yeah. we 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 could send you a better one. Yeah, I'm happy to replace any images in here. You guys have better ones. Okay, I couldn't tell you what was wrong with it. <laughs> I like that slide. I think all that information is useful. We already yeah. said this kind of earlier, right? You see that fear? Do we need a second one? No. No. Yeah. I'd delete that one. <laughs> is this photo more helpful to this slide than this one, though? Should I? No. 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 <laughs> Um, and I think this is probably something I changed if it's in red. I have to go back and look at I think this requires more detailed explanation. Correct. This is a big deal. Okay. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. These, when people are responding to our patients, they typically don't have a Doppler, correct? Don't have what? A Doppler. Uh, not usually, no. Okay. So, because I'm trying to think of how we can relate it to how they would be assessing that patient, given that we don't do mm -hmm. automatic cuff pressures on our patients. Yeah, that was one of the big things we talked about the last time because none of them have Dopplers in the field. So they really have their cardiac monitor um, or manual BP cuff. Um, yeah, that's kind of the extent. <laughs> yeah, it's just letting them know that they're in the pre-hospital setting. The bad assessment is going to be, are they awake or and have signs of core perfusion? So. Right. We yeah. cannot use the pulse. We cannot use the blood pressure cuff. So this yeah. slide really to say that you can technically get a blood pressure with the manual cuff, but you're not going to get, you're not going to be able to use the automatic cuff for anything. Um, and if they have a, they might not have a probable pulse. Um, yeah. And even if they do, we don't know what that means. Um, pulse ox can be unreliable. And so really it's just to, let them know that their typical tools for evaluation of perfusion are not going to be reliable. I don't take um, hotline calls, uh, but would you, um, those of you who do ever, ever find a um, autocuff systolic useful at all? Depends on the patient and the device, I guess, but yeah, maybe, maybe more HeartMate 3 era, but um, not, not we, overly. Could we put in a thing about um, deferring to the, or utilizing their clinical contact when assessing that patient's perfusion status? Oh, yeah. I think and incorporating the VAD numbers with that? Oh, I mean, or... I mean, they should be calling that in the beginning. But... But just to remind them, so if, if, if a VAD person isn't giving this presentation, like you guys are mentioning that somebody might be pulling it up and going through it on their own or teaching other people, um, yeah. this would be a good place, I think, as the person taking those calls to just remind them that rely on that clinical assist that you have from the coordinator, because we might be able to help them do some on the fly assessment skills that are not easily outlined in a PowerPoint. What about down on here in our assessment continued? If there are questions or well i don't i don't think there should be any consideration i think they should already be always on. okay
and that's already been said, but I guess it doesn't hurt to pound that point home. Just worried for the people that are self-learning this. That yeah. The fact that we're saying that their blood pressure might not be reliable and they might not have a pulse, but we're not there to explain what that means. Yeah. And can we go back to the previous slide for a second? Um, in the first box, um, can we just say blood pressure is normally taken with a, or typically taken with a manual cuff and a Doppler? I, I, I think the way it is right there, um, it's, it's lacking. So historical context, uh, the Doppler was uniformly voted down at the committee meetings because EMS doesn't have them. So we may and they don't. Be, let's just take that off then. I, it, they don't. It doesn't change anything for them to know that. I do. Th I guess I would say it's good for them to say because they have the ability to do manual blood pressures, but they don't typically do that. Normally, they go straight to their cardiac monitor. So I think putting first what we had, which is use your manual, take a manual BP, and if that, and then make sure they understand. Don't use a automated blood pressure reading. So that is okay in your context, the way it's written. I I think so because I, I think that's the only two options they have and understand. Okay, Sandy, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that, but I think for a pre-hospital, it makes the most sense. Yeah, I, I was just thinking where it says BP is usually taken. Maybe we should make it rather specific, mm -hmm. such as you know blood pressure is taken or must be taken with a manual cuff because otherwise they will throw them on the monitor and that'll be it but are they any more reliable with a manual cuff at all if they're using if they're using their stethoscope they may not hear it yeah well it, you know it <laughs> Because I'm, I'm kind of old school, and in my world, I look at the patient. That's, you know, blood pressure or not. Um, you know, assessing your actual patient is the best way to um, to get a feel of what's going on. I mean, if we have them taking blood pressure and they're not going to hear anything, then why bother? You know what I'm saying? It's just a little confusing. Yeah, I mean, right that, that really is the best message is to assess the patient. Um, Look at your I think we have that kind of down here when we talk about uh, well maybe not. Yeah, I guess we really don't. So maybe I mean I guess what I think is missing here is that like the top box maybe should be, you know, your most reliable assessment of perfusion in the VAD patient is their overall clinical appearance, not right. the Signs. Yeah, I think if we could do something like that. I think that would be better for them. So if we had a, like another box above this, uh, I could make everything smaller. I like that. Or, or just Agreed. have one slide that's very specific, you know, that kind of um, pushes the point that you need to look at your patient, assess your patient. Do we think a separate slide or another box with bullet points? I, I was just thinking maybe What's a separate the next slide. slide? Could we, you know, your most reliable uh, indicator of what's happening with your patient is to look at your patient and assess your patient, how your patient is, rather than relying on, you know, blood pressures and pulses and everything else. She can usually tell. I mean, if if they look sick, they're probably sick. Mm. The most. Uh, let me think. Yeah, indicator confusion.
will be how your patient is presenting, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, I think that's good. It makes it pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Color and cap refill. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I think it makes it, that makes it really clear. This is what you should be looking for rather than worrying about all the other things. Okay. And then add the L to that. That's all correct information, except would, LVAD at the top. Uh, is this meant to say that flows may be affected by arrhythmias? Yes. Is that what that means? Yeah, I was just going to suggest adding that. Okay. Can we go back? I, yeah. I just want to look at that a little yeah. closer. I we haven't explained VAD flows yet. Um, yeah, that's kind of why I wanted to put the information about how the pump works at the yeah. beginning of the presentation. Yeah. Okay. And I, I would like to say that you know they may they they with arrhythmias they may present um they may be stable clinically stable or de decompensate um i'm not sure we're saying that well enough here my other comment is do you want to put arrhythmias or dysrhythmias because your next slide has bad patients with dysrhythmias can we say dysrhythmias because i'm ocd I hope they have a rhythm. Am I spelling this right? There's not two R's. We kind of mentioned this already in the risk for bleeding, but I think the, the risk for bleeding is actually later. We just hop to it to show us something. I think the important point on this slide is that they typically, for for ischemic stroke, don't follow routine stroke protocol in terms of transport. Or, or management. Yeah. We've already spoken to the risk because of the anticoagulation, but I think for for EMS role, that's the important point here. And that your neuro. So the priority is you mean the priority is taking them to a VAT center over a stroke center? Is that what you're trying to say? Yes. Yeah, I, I think I think that's definitely important to add in. 
So you would still like to try to get them to their their home VAD center if possible, even if it's not the closest stroke center. Because if they go to another center, they will be transferred and it's a delay yeah. of care. Mm -hmm. um, center? Correct. Oh yeah, we have that. Well, this might be the stuff I did. It's all very good. It's something about flow in here. That wasn't, yeah. These are two things that I had added. I don't know if they're necessary. You guys wanted to go down to the, how the pumps work. I move that information. Yeah, I think talking about how the pump works more towards the beginning of everything um, well, maybe here, this from OVAD patient management. Because we talk about the assessment and stuff, but you need to know what you're looking at before you go and assess that patient. Where did we have that in here? It's like past the T, it's all. Hmm. I don't see it. I'm more than ha happy to mock up a one slider of how the pump works and send it to you if you want. Yeah, do you not have that? I don't see it now that we're... Here, here's a little more detail on the, the system configurations and the components just in the last couple slides but it there isn't a comprehensive slide in here that kind of at a glance explains it I mean it kind so I, of I, is I, here I, guess. I would I would take Lucy up on that offer <laughs> <laughs> I'm more than I think I have some actually somewhere <laughs> do you also think that that um, algorithm is um, is pretty good I that algorithm and they like algorithms in the pre-hospital world it's towards the end actually it's in the old presentation it's number 42 yeah it's towards the end so when we're talking about bad patients and stroke what's the next thing we need to talk about then um I'm assuming that we popped into reasons that the VAD patient would call 911, correct? Yeah, we talked about so, VAD patient stroke. And then the next slide was this VAD management slide, talking about administer fluid boluses and vasopressors. And then, but I thought it was important to kind of talk about like what's going to mess up the pump. Right, why they, what might be going on with that patient, why they would be calling you yeah. and how that might affect the pump. Yeah, so I have a slide in here that I suggested something about impaired pump flow from conditions that can alter preload and influence device flow, so hypovolemia. I don't know how many of these are totally relevant. Um, I can also, if you'd like, mock up a slide for that for what, um, what they might be getting a call for as to what's impairing their pump flow. Okay. And I, have here. I, I think, you know, talking about pump flow can get over um, complex. <laughs> and, and so I think the focus should 
kind of shift away from talking about, about the pump flow and okay. just keep it keeping the focus on pace and uh, talking about volume administration and um, and I think it's also very good to talk about you know common transport scenarios. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Okay. So. Maybe I'll take these out and put them at the end. Um, so the next section then is going to be like now we just go into the LVAD management, and I don't. I guess this is where I get confused in the presentation in terms of the flow of it. Um, going from stroke to this. And then we go back to like assessment again. Yeah, the, the, the flow is getting messed up here. And so if we're talking about common transport scenarios, you know, I think other than stroke, you know, it's it's um, volume related. So a slide dedicated to that would be good. And then um, one, um, even though arrhythmias have been mentioned, I mean, um, you know, those 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 are three big ones right there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't just have a stroke slide and move on. I would make sure those other scenarios are. So that'll be like our low volume slide, right? Wait, what do you put us? I think what do you so. put us? Thank you. What about, um, sorry, I was thinking Patty. What yeah. about um, making a little section of common transport things yeah that would be so actual heart failure instead of low volume like okay. heart failure exacerbation is one stroke you know mechanical fall or trauma yeah i think that would really up upgrade this presentation you know talking about real life scenarios and then I, we could have one slide on equipment failure because it's extremely uncommon but still having it as a possibility for them. Now, would so, you put this in as the front slide for before we talk about stroke, possibly? That was my recommendation was just like, before we get into yeah. the etiologies that may help the flow is if we list like common reasons these patients call 911, and then we've got the list and then we can kind of have a slide that goes into each one. Yes, I like that. Or like after rhythm assessment. What if we, yeah, what if we did um, what the pump is, how the patient gets the pump, assessment, and then common reasons they'd call 911. That sounds good. Where would I put this one? That could go with the stroke the two stroke slides in the comment after the Kaima 911, you can put stroke in there. So maybe we on this common 911 start, uh, the first bullet is stroke and then put stroke immediately after this common 911 calls. And then we'll do heart failure, exacerbation, definitions, falls, so on and so forth. Or... Okay. I like it. And probably above the one before. I mean, we talk about neuro assessment, but really we're talking about stroke. Okay. Should I call this stroke assessment? Neuro assessment? Yeah, because their neuro assessment while they have the pump isn't going to be different than your or my neuro assessment. Whereas yeah, this is more like a, 
This is more like assessment for stroke specifically. Yeah, I think yeah, Crystal is going to do it today. That makes sense. Okay. And then stroke. And then what was the next thing? Heart failure. I don't know if we have a slide for that, do we? I guess we have this one. Kind of. Alarms. Uh, I don't know. Like so after this one, heart failure exacerbation. I mean, would we add the volume kind of in that section, you guys think, or? Probably, right? Because it's related to their. Right, because a patient could be calling with low volume or high volume statuses. Yeah, and it's one thing that. EMS can do is, you know, administer volume or, um, you know, be a part of that. So I think it warrants, warrants some explanation. Um, you could put on there that these patients still have heart failure, even though they have an LVAD. I miss TAH. <laughs> Come on Don't over, Jeff. We're happy to have you. <laughs> oh, we just rather struggle with LVADs. I'm trying to figure out how to say that. So I just say to patients, LVAD patients still have heart failure. The LVAD doesn't cure their heart failure. Okay. And then may have symptoms related to low volume or high volume. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yes, in this one. Assess volume status. I mean, right, we're going to be talking about, then we can get into assessing the volume status and when we give a fluid bolus. Okay. And we have assessment for hypovolemia. Do you want to move that um, assessing for hypovolemia? Yeah, up a slide. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that that's not really an assessment. Is out of, yeah, that's out of context. The um, you know, I use that as a general guide to flow range for, and and it's it's really not meant for to explain could this, volume status. Could this be? And what should it be called? I would just start over on that whole thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really yeah. assessing pump flow, not hypovolemia necessarily, right? Correct. Right. correct. Um, and it's, it's not, it's a very rough guide to, to pump flow. Could this be up at the top when we talk about our general assessment? This may, this may, maybe we can push down, um, when we talk okay. about, uh, I'll keep pushing it down. <laughs> yeah, keep pushing it down. Yeah, yeah. Good. Do we I, find like it? It? <laughs> I think that's more pertinent when you're assessing the pump when you when you're asking them to look at the pump rather than because in, when we're looking at the heart failure, we're asking them to look at the patient. And I can tell you that I'm thinking that some people might say, how am I going to assess the volume status as part of my evaluation when I can't get a blood pressure? Yeah, Edema, so, so that whole, yeah, well, yeah. Assessing, heart failure right. symptoms. Yeah, that yeah I was thinking, can we pump put something in there? It can go away because if they're on the phone with the center, that, that can all be assessed, you know, in consult. Yeah, but we're hoping that they've, that they call them. I think that's the most important thing is to call 
the center. Okay. We should have that, you know, I, I don't know if we should have that. There's a separate slide somewhere right up front, <laughs> all the center, because I, I just think that that's important. Yeah, yeah, that could, that, that could be the whole presentation right there. <laughs> <laughs> but really. <laughs> yeah. Minimalism is uh, coming up, guys. Come on. Keep 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 the batteries on and call the center. <laughs> and then heart failure. So we have our heart failure slide, and then we kind of go to this one. I think that we could get rid of the first. The first two bullets on this slide have nothing to do with the rest of it. Right, this is true. Those that is useful and correct information, just not the best pop, spot for it. Yeah, I agree. We can and do then, like a packing up your patient. And slide. I don't, I don't like the headline at all. When in doubt, there should, they shouldn't be left in doubt. They should be on the phone. So I would take that whole thing out. Mm. When in doubt, call. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know what, the, what's about. true is in in. in you know, in an emergency code scenario, um, it's almost always a good thing to give volume, but we could cover that when we talk about a code scenario. Correct. So you want to talk Would about, because this is more like hypovolemia management, right? LVAD fluid management, or what did you guys want to title this one? Well, I think this, I think this gets into um, emergency or code scenarios, and I think we we should just ditch this whole slide and we and re it rework it later. I think the hard part about this slide to me is it had stuff on there about like call keeping the controller, but then it also talks about nitroglycerin. Yeah, it's right. a mess. It's a mess. I think it's, I think it's good information, but just not all together on that slide in this spot. Yeah. I'm going to move this one to the end too so we don't lose our information. So we remember to put it in there somewhere. So we have assessing for volume status. Do you want to put those little bullets under there of what that assessment might look like? Ed pitting edema, um, wet lung sounds. I don't know the lingo that pre-hospital uses necessarily. Crackle, thank you. That's a real word. <laughs> <laughs> um, orthopnea is a big one with our patients. Yeah, shortness of breath and orthopnea. Okay. So failure, and then the next one we had on our list was falls or do we want hypovolemia in here you, you know, do you want to put us here i think in talking about these different topics you know, i always get a lot of questions about um, medication administration and it's mm -hmm. a little out of my area as a perfusion background um, with perfusion background um, so i think the bad coordinators in the group if you could um, throw in some guidance here when appropriate on um, on medications, that would be really helpful for, for them. So is this the type of patient that you'd be putting on like CPAP or BiPAP? Potentially, yeah. If they're having respiratory distress, yeah. We didn't, I mean, how is this different than treating the non-VAD patient, you know? They're actually, it's they're actually more protected. Mm -hmm. Their circulation, your, their circulatory system is supported. So if they were to have, we've, I mean, we've had patients in ventricular standstill for like forty-eight hours at home, come in saying they don't feel well. Yeah. So they can be sustained for longer and have be in worse shape, but clinically okay, clinically looking, you know, all right yeah. on paper, but really not doing well. But if you are really want to mention hypovolemia in the heart failure section, if you add a second slide, mm -hmm. um, uh, it'd be physical assessment, 
fluid boluses as needed and in conjunction with the coordinator because we know we all know our patients almost down to the cellular level unfortunately so mm -hmm. we're really going to be the ones to help guide them on that particular thing because there is no one formula for every patient okay. all these patients are just very complex you take heart, heart failure and you give them a machine yeah yeah, I just want to make sure it comes across clearly, like what we're specifically recommending or not recommending. Like, is there something that they should not be doing in heart failure patients that have an LVAD? Or are there things that are okay to do? Because I think that the sort of, I think the feeling is that if they're in heart failure, they're going to want to put them on CPAP or BiPAP. Um, we're not really using Lasix or anything like that anymore, um, but potentially nitroglycerin, um, things like that that they would they would think of in their mind as being the appropriate treatment. Um, so we can, not I be appropriate. will tell you. I'll tell you that in the pre-hospital world, the first thing they're going to do, and this is this has happened, with my people is that they will call the center because they don't like this. <laughs> um, you know, to them, it's not a it's not an everyday occurrence, mm -hmm. and so the first thing they want to do is reach out the coordinator and I think that's what they do have Lucy uh, Patty is that not been your experience oh absolutely I mean yes. I've had people literally say can I stay on the phone with you the whole time we're transporting them I'm like sure <laughs> I'll meet you there um, okay so it wouldn't be a bad idea if you want to do another slide right after heart failure for like a heart failure continued and say patient can be, I mean, we talked about hypovolemia and hypervolemia. So if they're assessing for heart failure, we do want to avoid nitroglycerin because that decreases venous return and forward flow. Um, other than that, it's, we want them to treat the patient that they see in front of them, which is not a great straightforward answer, but they're the one assessing the patient and they're the one to see if they need to be intubated um, or anything like that. Avoid or do not use nitroglycerin. Do not use. Yeah, it's a do not. And that's actually for LVAD patients only. So if you want to say LVAD, nitroglycerin to LVADs, because THs, we actually do use that. Fluid boluses as indicated for hypovolemia. in conjunction with bad center consultation? Well, yeah, I was going to do another bullet that says, as always, this is to be in conjunction with the Elva, with the coordinator. Okay. Do you want to change that second bullet point to make it read a little better? Do not yes. give the nitro... Do not give nitroglycerin to the LVAD patient. Yes. Perfect. And there's no E at the end of nitro, right? Right. There's your an E? Yeah. Yeah, there and is. Clearly, I don't spell it out very often. <laughs> <laughs> I think that looks right. What do you guys think? Covers what we need to cover for fluid? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's pretty good. Okay. That's heart um, failure. And then we have fall slash. Which I think we do have something about uh, accidents or something later, maybe. But uh, mechanical falls and trauma related to their chronic anticoagulation. Okay. Do we have anything? Let me see. We have infection, too. That's also an important one. I'll put that on our list. 
Yeah. Well, we'll, we can put that. That's not a reason that they're going to call 911. No. I, I get no. lost. Your God, no. <laughs> no, that's, that's not a transport scenario. That's not a transport. That's that. We can mention that for other, um, like when I was thinking we could do like a packing up your patient couple of slides, okay. being cautious with the driveline removal. Um, they have this sterile dressing that might get infected. So it's a risk of infection, but that should not be an EMS thing. We just don't want no. them touching it. Similar to not cutting it when they take off the shirt. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So with falls, um, I, I remember one case where it was considered a trauma. So they, they you know, it, I, I'm not sure if it was a dispute or not, but they ended up, because it was a trauma, um, transporting to Osborne, um, the level one center. So maybe we should, um, again, that falls back on the consult with the hotline of each center where is the most appropriate facility um but i'm not sure if ems is bound to certain protocols where that's concerned mm -hmm. what kind of trauma was it you recall uh, off a ladder yeah i mean i think you'd be really hard pressed for them to call the vad coordinator on a trauma patient before deciding on a destination I, I don't know that that was happening. I guess I the point is, is no matter who the patient is and what the situation is, they need to be calling the coordinator because that patient, I can almost bet you, Jeff, who went to Osborne, then had to get transported over to Mayo. You yeah. guessed right. But then how many hours of that person's day got added on there? Like like <laughs> always, it, it, it delayed care, but it, it was one situation where we could not override their protocol, at least yeah. in the moment. Yeah, I, mean, I don't. Usually, I think we, that we patch call with the medical director, and but but this was kind of um, it uh, at the moment, cut and dry decision. Yeah. What, I, what do you want them to treat first, the trauma or the VAT? It depends, and that's why. That's yeah. That's why it's kind of. Yeah, I don't think there's any way you're going to have a very unhappy emergency department if you show up Here. with level one trauma patient that needs a thoracotomy or something weird. And I mean, I know yeah. that's not here, so but maybe, I mean, maybe we don't say anything and just again be on the phone with the yeah with the bad coordinator. I would say if time allows <laughs> or something like that, if patient yeah. condition allows, because we so here's a just devil's advocate. Patient gets into an MVC. Right. And the airbag goes off and damages their system controller and they need to have that changed out. And they're now brought to a hospital that has no idea how to do any of that. It's not as black and white as that. It might not impact the VAD. We won't know that until we see that patient and their LVAD. Yeah, I get it. We, we, we had to walk someone through an air vac from a regional or a, a small rinky dink hospital in LA to Cedars because their battery was low. And they didn't listen to us and they took her to a, a different center. I think the nice thing about it is, um, other than Mayo, um, they will be going to a level one trauma center. They're going to university or to Joe. Okay, Mayo, you need to become a level one trauma center. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Not in my, my career lifetime anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's really hard to say because if you have someone that hits their head and they're on anticoagulation and they don't go to a center with neurosurgery available or something, I don't know. Um, well, yeah, what if it, we? It on the, I have a question. I, if this is an extremity bleed, um, I'm assuming that they can still tourniquet that or not. Yeah, I, I really think it, it's going to depend on what it, you know, what is the most life-threatening condition. If it if, if it is a MVA and and, you know, they need a trauma surgeon, you know, we're not going to be able to provide that. Yeah, I think. Yeah. And so, time. so the 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 most appropriate facility, if everything's okay with the bad, and that's been assessed, is, you know, to to go to a center that has a trauma surgeon on call, 
then that's going to be the best call. So what about for the specifics for this slide? We say they're at a higher risk due to bleeding and um, from their anticoagulation. As always, call the coordinator to discuss the plan. Um, yeah. And they might need to, they might be walked through how to assess the LVAD functionality at that time. I mean, we don't have, we can keep it really basic. We don't have to say, you must go to this center on this slide mm -hmm. because it's not that easy. Yeah, I would keep it, I would keep it basic. And um, I would say maybe in some, in some cases of a, you know, severe trauma, that a level one trauma center may may be recommended by the VAD coordinator. I don't know. There's just no way on the scene of a major accident are they going to call a VAD coordinator with someone who's like bleeding and severely injured. And I think it would be. Yeah, and, and they're, they're not going to be faulted for following protocol in, that, in those scenarios. Yeah, I just think we have to be clear We do, because that is very confusing in the first place. Um, and it, we don't want to add any any more stress to an already stressful situation. And in most other scenarios, trauma will always take precedence over any other subspecialty. Can we just maybe like generalize it and say, use best uh, clinical judgment if able transport to that appropriate center or something like just something super basic i think without risking contradicting current transport protocols i think it would be hard to make that recommendation um i mean for minor injuries you could maybe say for minor injuries yeah for like ground level falls and i mean not major 13 car pileups we're not yeah. I, I mean, my brain didn't even go there. <laughs> our system, ground level falls on anticoagulation or an automatic trauma center transport in our system. Even if it's just a ground level fall and they're totally fine, um, if they're on anticoagulation, for the most part, many of them get brought to our level one trauma center. And that's not necessarily the way it is throughout the system. No, it's not, but it's yeah. very system dependent. Um, yeah. So I think that's why we have to be kind of generic because like, um, like Dr. Bradley said, we're, we're doing this for a wide range of people. It's completely across the state. What about um, saying, follow your trauma protocol? I mean, we can say, tell them to follow their protocol and if able to contact the mm -hmm. coordinator depending on the scenario. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably the right angle. Yeah. What if we say time slash situation? I'm good with it. You guys? Yeah, that, that works. Okay. And then we still have this pump flow thing we're moving down. Now, Jeff, you were saying to delete this slide because it was out of context. Is that correct? That it, we might end up just getting rid of it. I don't know if it's going to end up being useful or not. We'll see um, how detailed we want to get with because um, basically we just want them to be 
you know, the, the pictures of the faces of the, the controllers and being able to access the pump parameters and read them to the, mm -hmm. um, the coordinators is, is the key thing. They don't need to be able to interpret them. So I think it might be TMI. Okay. Agree. So right now we're at the end of our 911 section, right? We had, oh, equipment failure. Some important points here. Uh, ensure that the drive line is attached to the system controller. Do you want to make a general statement here about? Very infrequently, is it primary equipment malfunction? I mean, I don't know how to politely say read the screen, but um, <laughs> look, look, like, I mean, because a lot of our systems now give us um, verb or written um, kind of instructions or um, diagnoses for it. I always say use your words. <laughs> <laughs> you can say look at look first at the screen it, that it will prompt you. Yeah. I, I think I think there is a usable picture back in the presentation somewhere about the three critical connections with both heart heartmate and heartware. I think that would be useful. Agreed. As part of this slide. Pictures are very beneficial. Yeah, at the beginning, at the slide, I'm going to mock up with how the pump works. I'll put the pic with the arrows pointing at the controller, the different, the pump, the drive line. Okay. Kind of thing. Okay. Do we want to put that here too? Yeah. If you keep scrolling down, I think you'll find it. Um, oh. Yeah. This one? No, keep going. Right there. Oh, here, that one. Yeah. So maybe that move one. this up? Yeah. I wonder if this should be at the beginning. I think we should get rid of it. <laughs> okay. But this one, move up. I like that one. So. And, and we'll also just put Harmony 2 slash Harmony 3 on there. Yeah. And I agree, the patient pictures are extraneous. They don't need to be. Okay. It's the number three, which is stupid that they changed how they trademark. Is there anything you guys would put in the notes here for the presenter? Um, these are the connections that ensure that the pump will be connected to external power and function appropriately? I don't know. Please do not, um, <laughs> please be gentle with these connections. Yes, we say don't grind and find, but I don't know how well that will translate. <laughs> I like that. I'm gonna start <laughs> using that. Ain't um, bad, don't grind and find. Yeah. And, <laughs> You know, I think, I, again, the important thing here is the visual, so I wouldn't make the picture smaller. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, you could just um, just say each, both systems have different comp looking components, but there are three critical connections. Um, that's, that's the take-home point here. And you never take away both powers, never take away the drive line. And we okay. don't, we can't, we, we don't even have to say both powers. We just say power. I mean, is this what they're checking, right? If there is like a failure or something? Well, this yes. is what the, the hotline will ask them to look at. Okay. Yeah, we'll make sure, especially before they load them up, that the patient's on battery power and not wall power. And that all of that equipment is like in their lap or in their bag. Okay. 
So the patient may need to be disconnected from wall power or? Um, the patient may be on wall power on arrival. Um, you could also put in there to use the caregiver support. And the hotline support, because we walk people through how to make that connection regularly. Okay. Okay. Can you go back up to, to the equipment failure thing? Um, I want to... Um, can you say like when in doubt, also take over the pump? Because we want to for assessing to ensure that the pump is on. I I hesitate to even have a slide on equipment failure. Okay, um, I'm good with that. Uh, it just it plants a seed that you know that they, they should be focusing on the patient, and and we all know the odds of it you know, primary equipment failure. Right. As long as we have, I like that critical VAD connections because I did have a patient with a disconnected driveline in the past year. And that was the only thing, but it's not a failure. It's a human error. <laughs> yeah, human error, not not a pump That's thing. what we're worried about. And Operator error. Yeah. yeah. And so so I, I think, I don't know. I don't like this, the title of this slide anyway. Okay. You can get rid of it. I'm good with that. I mean, but it's possible, right? Mm. Happen? Yeah, it, it's very rare. Any... It's, yeah. it's statistically, it's just, I, I don't think it's, of, well, course I think... it's of course it's possible, but you know, they're not going to be able to troubleshoot or do anything about it anyway. Um, so, so I mean, what about this thing? What about to say, do not focus on evaluating the equipment? Because I think it is important to tell them, please do not focus your attention primarily on the equipment. Please focus on the patient assessment. Yeah, make sure the pump is on and then assess the rest of the patient. What if we change it to... Um, Rare? On that, first, on that first bullet, primary equipment malfunction is extremely uncommon or extremely rare. Focus on patient assessment. Yeah, and you could add hotline will help you troubleshoot any potential equipment issues. Yeah, I like that. Um, troubleshooting, assessment slash troubleshoot. I just want to make sure that like, because I don't want to take it out entirely because I think that the when you see something that you don't see often, your tendency is to focus on that. Yeah. Will you, you just, italicize extremely since we're getting all fancy on this? I, I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> I like it. Okay. Yeah. Just so that they know, look at the patient. Don't look at the pump until we've gotten all this other stuff out of there. Yeah. Okay. And then on that last bullet, I would take away again, when in doubt. I mean, okay. I don't it, it, they shouldn't be left in doubt. So, um, right. Assess pump function by auscultation. Love it. Okay. Will you add function after pump? Mm 
And then we have our VAD connections, just so they know what they'll be potentially needing to identify. Good. I like the caution with clothing removal, too. Um, do you guys, Jeff or Eddie, when you guys teach this stuff, do you ever get, I mean, I always get questions about what happens if you cut it every single time. Do you guys get those too? Like, do we need to put on that slide? If you cut the drive line, get that patient in the ambulance right now. I get the Grey's Anatomy story pretty much every Ugh. training that I do. <laughs> and I had no idea that many people watched Grey's Anatomy. Oh, that's, um, where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, just watching sports, I guess. Um, I mean, I yeah, always get that question. What do I do if it does get cut? I, I really Good luck. I just say don't cut it. I okay. do too, but we oh, we always get the devil's advocate. So what it should we put in there? Like, if this happens, call the coordinator and pack them up, get them in the rig. I'm just thinking about the people who are not being presented. This I topic. I would I would say that it's not. You know, if you want to pre present that scenario, I would say that it's not fixable. Um, yeah. And, and if that, you cut this, the patient will die. Yeah. And that that transport is is really the becomes the most important thing at that point. Can I take this picture up then about the case where they got the elbow wires cut? Yeah, yeah you can get I, rid of that. I, you know that whole thing, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't think that's worth presenting. You know, it didn't work. You know, it was it was a kind of a heroic effort, but um, it did restart the pump, so I guess it worked. But it was well beyond the the time frame where the patient was viable. So um, I wouldn't even go there. Yeah, I would. Take I like that the out. picture though, with the frayed wires. Yeah, well, yeah, not the repair, but the frayed wires. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. This, which part? Which picture? I don't even think they could see that's a repair. Here, guys, sorry. I, I have to jump off real quick. I'll be right back. All right. Okay. Hey, uh, yeah, this is... I don't... I'm okay I, I like that. caution with clothing removal and, and, and showing an intact drive line, but this whole, you know, this was a one-off scenario that we're showing yeah. pictures of here. It's, it's just not worth showing. Okay. So Let's see. Caution with the removal. We go all the way out. Uh, oops, hold on. This guy. Mm -hmm. If the drive line's cut. You know, I think this could be part of one slide that goes over, you know, when transporting care of the equipment and drive line, move the equipment with the patient, you know, have have an awareness of where the drive line, you never want any stress on the drive line. I think those could all be bullet points on the same slide. The less with clothing removal and more with care of the drive line during transport. Or care of the equipment and drive line. Okay. Passing and removing clothes. And you said, what else did you have in there? Um. Transport. Always ensure there is no no stress or twisting of the drive line. No stress in the drive line or twisting, something like that. And here's where we may want to mention that. Um, any extra, the patients always have an extra bag with their backup controller that should be transported with them. 
I would say Excuse that's me. good enough. Bring any the, any ex, the extra you say, bag. Please bring the backup bag with emergency equipment because they all have one. Yes. Not. Yeah. Uh, we, I mean, please bring, what if we say, please bring the extra equipment in the black backup bag. Cause the patient will know what that means. They will yes. know what that means. And we will know what that means. Okay. Do we need to say don't disconnect anything? You said that here, right? Okay. Can we make those two red points bigger on that slide? <laughs> <laughs> if that's going to be the place we put it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I like that. That's better. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Okay. Too. Thank you. This one? Can you go? Can you go back to that connection slide for a second? I just yep. noticed something um, that might be incorrect. Oh yeah, the heart mate two and three. Again, they use Roman numerals for the two, and then the number three for the. Yeah, there you go. Yes, it's dumb. We know. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. Okay. Don't worry, I will. <laughs> Okay. What if we, what's the next slide? I know there's a couple on infection. What if we put um, that infection above the drive line? Like up one, yeah, swap those two. Because that's a complication, and we're saying that we then the next slide is that we keep a sterile driveline exit site. And can we get rid of that bottom bullet? Because we don't want them assessing the driveline at all. Okay. We want actually, we can say in there, we could probably make this one slide mm -hmm. where we say they're at a higher risk of infection due to chronic, um, chronic heart disease as well as having an implanted pump. We use sterile technique when changing the dressing. Please do not lift up the dressing or assess it. Yeah, so I'd combine the, all you need is one of these pictures for the sterile dressing off the next slide, just to show them what it looks like. And then just, I would have a bullet point mentioning that, you know, this is just for awareness and that this usually isn't a reason to transport patients. I, it, if, you, if, if Lucy, if you think that's totally worth mentioning. Agree. I mean, not even. We can if for the, or we can write it in the little note section. Like this is something that should be dealt with. This is something that would be dealt with with the coordinator should not require. Yeah, because all we want them to know here is that it should be covered by sterile dressing, and it is a and it it is an issue, and that their role with it, I guess this is worth mentioning. Their role is to make sure there's no tugging, yeah, um, on the drive line, because that's when they get infected. How about the wet thing, do we need that comment. I mean. The whole patient shouldn't get wet. Yeah. <laughs> but the electronic side of it is a little more worrisome with the wet at this particular junction. I would say ensure there's no tugging or stress on the driveline um, to help prevent infection.
Look at like that. And change that middle bullet point to LVAD. Oh, yeah. Thank you. On that middle one, on that middle bullet, can you say do not lift up the dressing? That was the second sentence. Not that anybody really wants to, but there's always one or two looky loos. Jeff, you're laughing because you know it's true. <laughs> and, then yeah, and, they, and they like to take apart my training equipment too. And this is the one I had a question on for. So then I guess we need to like talk about cardiac arrest, right? Yeah. So we could probably get rid of this slide and then yeah. just do an emergency management slide. Okay. So Which I have one. I don't know if you want it. I have like a, if the pump is on versus the pump is off, emergency response. Gotcha. And I think I have something like that in here. So the rest of these are, so if I go down, these are just extra things. But in our presentation before, we had this right here. So pump on, pump off. Yeah, so but, pull, those, this, pull those up into the LVAD section. But my question was whether or not, so the American Heart Association came out with their recommendations. Do you guys follow those in terms of the MAPS or the end tidal CO2? Um, yeah, I've seen I've seen their algorithm for LVAD codes, and um, there's still so many judgment calls um, that yeah, it's nice. I know I know they like protocols, and it's nice to have a protocol, but it's really not there. There's there's judgment calls along the way, right? Yeah. Um, so I hesitate to publish that as the protocol. Okay. Also, can they all read that easily? Because I struggle reading that algorithm a little bit. One, yeah. With the pump on, pump off, because I went through it when I was doing a fire department teaching and was like, ooh, I'm a little bit tripped up with the flow of this. Um, we, at least at our hospital, if the pump is off, we do, and the patient's unconscious, we do CPR. Um, we haven't really come into the, if our map, if the pump is on and the map is less than 50, because we have drugs right. to make that map be higher than 50 or fluid. Um, but otherwise. They so do like doing? algorithms. So if we can make it flow the way you would like it to flow, that would probably be good. Yeah, so the only thing that I've changed in here, and this is just like adding that in if the pump is on, but if we don't think that this is something they should be doing, because the only thing they're going to have is an end tidal CO2. They're not going to have a map. Right. So they're really going to be relying on, after they've intubated the patient, Right. what is their end tidal CO2? I mean, are they ever going to get that far? I mean, our basic assessment is if the pump is off, assessment one, your patient's unconscious and their LVAD is on, you're going to do everything you can to medically manage that patient. If you look at that patient, they're unconscious and their LVAD is off, we need to make sure that someone is turning that LVAD on so then the patient will potentially improve. Right. So what do you do when you talk to EMS over the phone? Because unless you're an emergency physician, you can't give medical direction over the phone. So how do you guys normally handle that? We talk and I ask them, okay, I, is the screen on? Depending on the type of pump, have them assess for if the LVAD is on and if the patient is breathing on their own, if they're conscious. Um, if they're clinically deteriorating, I tell EMS to follow their algorithms, get the patient as stable as they can and get them to the ER. Okay. And if the pump is off, we always advise for CPR if the patient's unconscious. Okay. So Amber, um, one of the issues in regards to kind of the medical direction question that we've talked about and we had gone through kind of the bureau before I was at, at this position was um, if there's a question about getting specific advice, the crew can always do a three-way call 
with yeah. their medical direction and the coordinator. Um, right. Typically, all of us as medical directors are just going to defer and say, yes, please do whatever the coordinator says. Um, but that is how we've kind of handled that as a teaching point, uh, because uh, you're correct, technically, EMS can't get the medical direction, but I think most of us recognize you guys are the experts and we want to make sure that um, EMS is able to follow that. Right. Okay. Yeah, maybe, um, Lucy, I like your simplification of this is this is like overcomplicated. I agree. Um, it's not, it's, it's so nuanced in real life um, and it's also nuanced on this slide. Um, but I think it would be useful to have a visual algorithm, um, a simplified version of this. So maybe if you could put something like that together, if you have something already. Um, Amber, what's your email? I don't, d uh, it is a rice. I can put it in the chat really quick. Okay. Sorry, Jeff, not to cut you off. No, yeah, I think, I think too, the, you, you know, it, based on EMS response, you know, if the pump's off, the patient disconnects or something, you know, tries to do a controller exchange and doesn't make it through, you know, they're going to be on the time frame of really being able to do anything, you know, to restart the pump. It may be contraindicated and it may be better to do chest compressions at that point or do CPR. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with anything. Um, you said, Lucy, it would, it would fall in line with, with Mayo, what Mayo would recommend as well. I think, I think it is helpful to point out what they can do like this box down um, on the lower left. It's like, what, what can you do? <laughs> um, well, you can do these things. I think that's probably useful for them. Amber, I'm just looking on my computer for my little tree. Okay. You probably could take out ESS Doppler BP because they don't have a Doppler. Where's that at? That's in that little box on the on the left hand side, the blue box. Assess rhythm, ICD firing, VTAC, cardioversion, assess Doppler BP. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take that out. I mean, IO access would be okay too, right? Sure. I don't think so. And then I don't know if we want to be specific with the drugs. You know what? When I look at this slide, this was something I used for like Mayo satellite facilities. It, I, it wasn't very well th thought through for a EMS application um so i apologize for that it's pretty bad so we'll simplify this right amber i just sent you my it's a two slide little presentation i have one slide for lvat emergency response and one for um tah and we can set definitely have a second meeting just to kind of finalize this before education. Education doesn't meet again until I believe July, correct Shelley? Yeah, I was gonna put all this stuff in there that people sent and any pictures that I got sent. Um, and then we can do the second meeting to kind of go through the rest, you know, go through it. Cause we're sort of at the end of the hour now. That works and I can, um, I will send you the one to two slide high level overview of how it works in the human. Okay. So I can put those slides in. I could put the recommended updated um, flow chart in there. Well, and if you don't like it, I'm not offended. It's just the, the Reader's Digest version that I made for our education here, especially with the fellows and stuff because there's so many hands on all these patients. Yeah. Um, and then what about the alarms? I think we could really simplify the alarm pages um, into one slide that says, what if I hear an alarm? 
and that regardless of the device, we want them to look at the system controller because it has lights, sounds, and words and be in conjunction with the coordinator. I think we can really streamline the alarms. Um, you could say regardless of the device, the system controller will have a message with what is wrong with the alarm or what the alarm is and a basic troubleshooting. Uh, most importantly is ensure that there are two power sources attached to the system controller and the driveline. Do you agree, Jeff? Um, getting rid of all the other alarms and just simplifying it into one Absolutely. Yes, I agree. And then is there a slide? Did I put a slide in there about showing the faces of the controller and where they can silence the alarm? Because it's okay Ooh. to silence. Most That's of the alarms true. can be silenced. Most, not all, but most can be silenced. And, you know, it may help their situation if they do. I'm not sure if I have a slide. I, there's definitely slides there. with the faces of the controllers. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. There we go. The controller slide thirty. Yeah. Eight. Where we have up. No, the thirty-eight is probably the best one. Um, again, too much detail. Probably just maybe just say, get rid of all the other boxes and arrows and leave the alarm silence. Yeah, I like that. And just say all bad controllers to be more correct. I don't think it's bad to mention the yellow and red because, I mean, I always say like most things in life, yellow just means that it needs attention, whereas red is something that's more emergent. And what about this one then? Oh, you can get rid of that. We can get rid of that. The slide? Yeah. 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 You can get rid of that. And the, the power yeah, the one with all the batteries. Move this up to are you putting this up here with the alarms? Yeah. So I think slide 28 and probably 27 can go away. Yes. Okay. Too much detail. There we go. Okay. okay. And then do we want to do emergency response after the alarms and then move to TAH? That's what I would suggest. Yes. That's how I would teach it. Personally. Yes. So emergency response here. Yeah, LVAD emergency response. Okay. Cool. And then, and then do we want to pause and do start on that, the next section next time? Yeah. Given it's five of now? Yeah, I think that sounds good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> by the end of the week, Amber, I will have you those couple of slides. And that's the emergency response, this one, but we're putting it down lower. Yeah. We're replacing that one. And then, then the next slide with the picture of the heart, you can uh -huh. get rid of that. Just get rid of that. Okay. This guy? 24, yeah, get rid of it. Yeah, they don't need all that. You're making one similar to this, right? 
Yes, well, I'm gonna. Yeah, well, I will make sure that when we when I have the slides of how they work, there will be a picture like kind of of that level of detail of what the pump is in the human, as well as how that works. Okay. And then we'll do part. Then all we have left is the total artificial heart rate. Yeah. So these, um, if you go down, go to twenty. All right, starting at. Back up a little bit. Keep backing up. Keep going. Uh, Lucy, do you need any of these? Um, no, I can use the images that I want. I have this presentation, so I'll use the images that I want off of it. And okay. for my so slide, so I don't need them. Delete, delete this one. You can delete 33. That one. Delete. 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 You don't want to show them lots of fancy pictures? We would this like one, to think they care. <laughs> this one, this one worth, we're keeping. 33, yeah. delete. Yeah, agree. Power management, delete. Uh, delete this I one. knew there was a pump flow slide somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Too complicated. Agreed. We can get rid of that one. Delete. Delete 33. Um, this one we're covering in that other. I feel like we're covering that a lot. Yes. So that's oh, yeah. kind of, that's, this is oh, all in yeah. the, the algorithm. Yeah. Except for bringing the backup bag, but we already mentioned that. So you can get rid of this one. Okay. And this is the other one that I made. We're, we're redoing that one. Yeah, I think we're down to TH then. Okay, cool. All right. As soon as I get those other slides in, I'll slip them in and I'll email them to the group. How about that? Okay, sounds good. Like whatever, by the end of the week, or whenever I get those. Sounds uh, good to me. And then I can send them out. Is that what you guys have time to review them before the next time we get together? Sound. Sounds good. Sounds, Sounds good. good to me. Great, great. We got a lot done. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And Shelly, you'll get with everyone to help us make a new meeting, maybe? Yes, if we want to do a poll or if you guys want to go ahead and assign a date like you did before. Okay. We'll have a second meeting and uh, do another iterative process. Okay, perfect. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.